BBC News at four minutes past ten. Our next at eleven. And now the first in a series of Sunday night documentaries marking the 75th anniversary of the BBC. This week, Sir David Attenborough introduces the reminiscences of a key player in the corporation's annals. Hello, BBC. This is Frank Gillard here, recording just outside Tilly, a mile or two back from Tilly, on Friday morning, June the 16th, during a barrage which is being laid down to prepare the way for an infantry attack on a small village just to the east of Tilly. In this barrage, we've got our 4.2-inch mortars, our field guns, our medium guns, all the guns of the fleet. The shells are whistling overhead now. Just listen to them. was the voice of Frank Gillard. In perhaps his most familiar role, that of BBC war correspondent broadcasting from Normandy 53 years ago. It was my luck, and much to my benefit, that for several years I sat alongside Frank on the BBC's board of management. As we shall hear during the next hour, Frank Gillard's BBC evolved out of all recognition during those intervening years, taking him from a part-time contributor to schools programmes into the higher echelon of BBC management. Today, at the age of 88, Frank is still actively involved in one of the corporation's long-term projects. Well, I don't know what Frank's going to make of this, but we've unearthed another facet of his many talents. There's cheese, cheese, running around with ease. In the stores, in the stores. Cheese, cheese, running around with ease. In the quartermaster's stores, my eyes are dim, I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. I have not brought my specs with me. Well, that, unbelievably, was Frank Gillard's very first broadcast, transmitted in the West region of the BBC during Christmas 1936, while Frank was still pursuing his career as a schoolmaster in his native Devon. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time for one of the many outside broadcast celebrations. That one came from Blackborough House near Cullerton, where Frank was on the committee of a home for unemployed wayfarers and they could certainly sing with gusto in those far-off days prior to the Second World War. Frank's view of the BBC at that time was echoed by much of the nation. Before the war, it was a high-minded, rather haughty institution. It was admirable in many respects. Its standards were high and all that sort of thing. But it was not an, an institution beloved of the people. And uh, there's no doubt about it that but for the war, the BBC would have been uh, very substantially altered by legislation in the course of the next few years. I mean, this was quite clear to everybody. This couldn't go on. But when the war broke out, because the government had said that broadcasting won't be required, none of the staff had been reserved. All those of military age were called up at once into the armed services. So the BBC was left with very small staff. Then it was found that broadcasting had to go on. And so there had to be a, a mass recruitment campaign. And I was one of the people swept in. Uh, I didn't apply to join the BBC. I was a broadcaster with experience. The BBC came to me, and, and I was reluctant to come. And, and I was virtually told the government has orders of direction, and you can be directed into the BBC if necessary. So that's how I came in. But th this happened to very large numbers, and we were different people altogether. We didn't come from the higher ranks of society to begin with. You know, we were people who came in from the journalistic professions, from, from the entertainment profession. Mm -hmm. We changed the whole culture of the BBC. We, we changed the whole nature of the organisation. We were in touch with these poor, wretched people outside who lost their homes, who were sleeping in the underground tube stations and all sorts of similar places all over the country. We were with them. We, and they were the people who looked to us. I mean, they thought the BBC was marvellous. And, and we couldn't help being close to them and being joined with them in the great war effort. 
the homeland is in danger and there's trouble in the air. We forget our little squabbles and its trespasses beware. All the nation is united when the danger looms in sight. And we march along together as we sing with all our might. We must all stick together, all stick together and the clouds will soon roll by. We must all stick together, all stick together, never mind the old school ties. United we shall stand, whatever may befall, the richest in the land, the poorest of us all. We must all stick together, birds of a feather, and the clouds will soon roll by. England has become one vast ordnance dump and field park. I've driven through it today for the best part of a hundred miles. The roads crammed with military traffic and lined, often enough on both sides, with vehicles of all kinds, just pulled off and parked on the verges. Vast, really vast numbers of them. And great mountains of stores, weapons and ammunition, rations, bridging equipment, tires, timber, millions of tons. And right in the midst of it all, just as I'd turned for home, I passed a field where 22 men in khaki shirts and battle dress trousers and heavy hobnail boots were having a quiet knock-up game of cricket. They made me think of Francis Drake and Plymouth Hoe. You see, the thing about the war correspondent life was that um, somebody, I don't know who, has said that for most people warfare it consists of, of, of long periods of intense boredom interspersed with short periods of tremendous activity. But for the war correspondent, it's tremendous activity all the time because every day you want to go where the action is. If you're doing a job properly, that's what you'll do. And that was the reason why there were more casualties in the core of war correspondents than there were in any other unit in the war. Because we always, every day, if we were doing our job properly, tried to get to where the action was taking place. And that's the sound of a British tank as it drives its way through the rubble and the street of Catania. The rubble is a demolished house which has been blown up by the Germans before they left the town and the rubble is strewn right across the mouth of a side street and now our tanks are slowly driving their way through you heard the first one more are coming up here they come the first one is getting clear the second one is just approaching me now it's about 10 yards away cautiously picking its way through because of the overhead wires which are getting entangled in it montgomery was very proud of the fact that he was the first general in history, as he used to say, who could speak directly to all his men, to every officer and man under his command. He did that, of course, by broadcasting. So he sent for me. Our recording equipment had not yet come ashore, and our transmitter had not yet come ashore. And I had to say to him with great regret that I had at that stage no means whatever of putting him in the voice on the air over the BBC. This was in his caravan, we were discussing this, and he was greatly disappointed. And while we were sitting there, I suddenly noticed a telephone on, on his desk behind him. And I said to him, you can't by any chance speak to the war office in London on your telephone, can you? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I can. He said, it's only recently been put in an hour or two ago, but I gather it's a radio telephone link, he said, and, and it's direct to the war office. And I said, well, may I use the telephone? And he looked at me as if I was a bit mad, but he said, well, I suppose you can if you wish to. So I picked up the telephone, and his operator outside said, sir, and I said, please put me through to the war office. Next voice said, war office, and I said, please put me through to the BBC. You have a direct line, I believe. The voice at the other end said, yes, sir, we can. And the next voice was BBC. And I said who I was, and I said, please put me through to the recording channels. So the next voice I heard was, recording and I explained the situation quickly to the engineer at the other end, and I said, you must please give me a recording channel immediately. And he said, oh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Gillard, but all the recording channels are in use. We're recording programs for, for future broadcasting. And I said, well, one of them has got to be interrupted for 10 minutes because this is a priority matter. And he said, will you take responsibility, Mr. Gillard? And I said, certainly. So he said, right then, I'll plug you through, and you can go ahead in 30 seconds. So I, I timed myself 30 seconds. I made a little announcement over, over the telephone. I handed the telephone to Monty. He took the telephone and read his script over the telephone. He handed the telephone back to me and I signed him off. And I said to Monty, now 
I swear to you that the very next BBC newscast, you'll hear your voice coming back over the air. And Monty thought this was a marvellous piece of enterprise. He was very impressed by it. And it gave us great reclame in Monty's eyes. Uh, we were a body, we were a resourceful lot of people who could accommodate him even in the most difficult circumstances. And that was the sort of thing that Monty was very proud of indeed. I want personally to congratulate every officer and man in the Allied Army on the splendid results of the last four days. British, Canadian and American soldiers, fighting gallantly side by side, have achieved a great success and have placed themselves in a good position from which to exploit this success. To every officer and man, whatever may be his rank or employment, I send my grateful thanks and my best wishes for the future. And it was that very first use of the telephone for broadcast purposes that helped Frank become a close confidant of Montgomery. In fact, Monty's demands on Frank didn't let up, even when he was lying on his sickbed. I'd picked up the malaria bug in North Africa. It's a bug that repeats itself until it's worked its way out of your system. And there I was lying on a mattress somewhere or other in a high fever and realising that standing beside me was Johnny Henderson, who was Monty's ADC. And Johnny said, oh, the master's very sorry to hear that you're not well. He hopes you'll soon be fit again. And he's asked me to come to you to tell you that he wants you to get him a puppy. And I said, he wants me to get him a what? And Johnny said, well, he wants a puppy. You know, he's mad about animals. And Johnny said, well, he thinks that the next time you go on the air, you simply say that the General Montgomery wants a puppy and he'll get one. And I said, yes, he'll get a thousand and he'll choose one and I shall have to look after all the others. And Johnny said, well, it's your problem. He wants a puppy and he expects you to get him one. And I remember it was in the in very near the wretched little town of a very, very small town village, really, of Douvres, which was right up in the northeast part of our bridgehead, almost under the German guns. And just outside Douvres, I came across a, a troop of tanks uh, under cover in a wood. And I uh, did some recordings with them. And I said to the tank commander that I was looking for a puppy. And he said, in that village in there, there is a man who's got a, 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 a Scotch terrier with three puppies. But he wouldn't give it to me. He demanded 25 pounds for it. And uh, I had to find the money for him. But I got the puppy took it straight to Monty at his headquarters, and he was enchanted with it. He called it Hitler, and Hitler gave Monty immense pleasure. There are lots of photographs of Monty and, and Hitler uh, at that time, and all the great visitors who visited Monty, de Gaulle, Eisenhower, the king, if you please, they all had to admire this, this puppy. And indeed, there are photographs of them um, clutching the puppy in some cases. I tell you, the postscript to the story concerned the £25 that I'd paid for the puppy. I naturally put it as a claim on my next expenses demand. And eventually, that claim was returned to me, and this line, puppy for General Montgomery, was crossed out. And this happened month after month after month. I kept repeating it. Until there came a time when I was back in London, I was recalled for 48 hours for the consultation. And I went to see the accountant who was dealing with my affairs, the BBC accountant. And I said, why do you keep crossing this off my expenses claim? And he, in a very haughty way, said, the BBC receives its licence fees to provide services and programmes to its listeners, not for the purchase of puppy dogs for generals. And I went straight to a BBC department called Programme Index, which keeps a record of every broadcast and every detail connected with it. I went back to the accountant and I handed him this piece of paper and I said, well, there is a list of all the broadcasts undertaken by General Montgomery over a period of two years and more. And you'll see that he has not up to now received any payment whatever for, for those broadcasts. His fee is £25 and uh, it is due to me because I have already paid him that amount in kind. And the accountant said, oh, very well, you win. And I got my 25 pounds. For a while we must part But remember me, sweetheart Till the lights of London shine again And while I'm over there Think of me in every prayer the lights of London shine again I'll keep your 
picture near me, a tender souvenir. Now hold me close and kiss me, and may God bless you, dear. Don't you cry when I'm gone. Wear a smile and carry on till the lights of London shine again. During the three years that Frank Gillard was actively reporting from North Africa, Italy, Normandy, and finally Berlin, a tiger in the chase of a story was how one colleague described him, the BBC back home was experiencing its own problems. The government, stupidly, in the preparation for the war, had assumed that broadcasting would not be required at all, and therefore has said that the Board of Governors will be dissolved, they will disappear. In the end, they were persuaded to retain the chairman and the vice chairman. The chairman was Sir Alan Powell, and the vice chairman was this man, Millis. Millis and Powell were confronted by the problem, of course, of, of dispersal. When the war broke out, the staff was dispersed, as planned, to Bristol. Only the news people remained in Broadcasting House. All the departments went down to Bristol. Nobody seemed to think that Bristol was going to be bombed. In no time at all, Bristol was, was devastated by bombing, but most of the church halls and assembly rooms and things that had been fitted up as temporary studios were hit, uh, the, the staff had to go. And they were moved out, they were moved to Evesham, some of them, some of them went to Bangor in North Wales, some of them went to Bedford, they were dispersed all over the place. And the BBC had to find premises and accommodation for them, and billeting arrangements and supplies of every kind, and, and all this involved money. Now, the BBC's licence fee was a very small, 10 shillings a year, I think, at that time, 50 pence in our language, ridiculous. And, and this, of course, was totally inadequate to meet all the expenditure that was pouring out to face these, these, these complications. And so a, a grant in aid arrangement was made, so that the Treasury supplied money to the BBC. But, of course, whenever it came to any, any kind of large expenditure, especially of a capital kind on premises and that sort of thing, this mm -hmm. took the Treasury, even in wartime, ages to agree. And Millis and Powell, found themselves having to sign contracts for which they had personally to give the guarantees and they found themselves in hock to hundreds of thousands of pounds which they hoped the Treasury would eventually reimburse but there was absolutely no assurance that this would happen. On the 6th of June 1944 came Operation Overlord, the D-Day Normandy landings. D-Day has come. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern face of Hitler's European fortress. The first official news came just after half past nine, when Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, usually called SHAPE from its initials, issued communique number one. This said, under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The scene that comes to my mind when somebody talks to me about the Normandy invasion was that vast array of shipping in the channel. I mean, there was hardly room for any water. There were so many ships there. Do you know, it took 500 ships of one size and another to move one division. And in the first six days, we moved 16 divisions. You can imagine the channel absolutely crammed with shipping as far as the eye could see in, in all directions. It was absolutely incredible. I remember one officer saying to me on the beach that right there in Normandy, when you look at all this, he said, you know that we've just got to win. It's Friday, July the 14th, the National Day of France. This is Frank Gillard recording in Normandy. And we've just been passing through a small Norman village with our recording truck and the approaches to the village were lined with folk coming from their farms and their cottages wearing all their best clothes turning out obviously for some celebration of Bastille Day and when we reached the village itself here we found the church bells ringing they're some of the first church bells that I've heard they're certainly the first peal of bells that I've heard in Normandy just listen to them for a moment while the people stream past us here going into the tiny churchyard and into the church itself This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news read by Frederick Dreiswood. We begin by taking listeners over direct to one of our transmitters in Germany where Frank Gillard is waiting to speak. I was broadcasting from General Bradley's headquarters. He was the commander-in-chief of the army group in the center of the European front. 
and uh, I'd, I'd been assigned to him for a few weeks because it was anticipated that that's where the end of the well, that's where the link up would come anyway with the Russian forces and uh, I was uh, joined there by three American radio reporters but the only way of transmitting a, a message back was through the BBC transmitter which I had taken with me a mobile BBC transmitter in touch with London we all four of us had this wonderful story about the, the link up the question was who was going to broadcast it first and I said, of course, it's a BBC transmitter, and I go first. And the other said, but this is an American headquarters, and everything else here is shared among everybody equally. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we, we can't agree that you go first. So I went to the chief of staff, General Bell, and I said, now look, here's the situation. You give us a judgment of Solomon. And he judged against me. And Crestfall and I went back to the other three and said, well, you win. We've got to toss up for it. But, but Providence was on my side. We tossed up for it, and I won. You know, it was only by a freak of chance that mine was the voice that said to the world, because, you know, once I'd said that, it was round the world. Two minutes later, it wasn't news any longer, it was history. East and West have met at 20 minutes to 5 on Wednesday afternoon, April the 25th, 1945. American troops of General Bradley's 12th Army Group made contact with Soviet elements of Marshal Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Army Group near the German town of Torgau on the Elbe. This is the news for which the whole Allied world has been waiting. Nazi Germany, tottering to her final collapse, has been split clean in half. The forces of liberation have joined hands. Coming home, my darling. Coming home to you. I can see your bright eyes shining in the clouds. There's a silver lining through the years of sadness. Waiting for the day when I'll be coming home to you. Following the end of the war, Frank Gillard returned to the BBC at Bristol and very soon became head of programmes for the West Region, a quite enormous area which stretched from Brighton to Land's End. The Director General of the BBC, Sir William Haley, called a press conference to announce plans for broadcasting in peacetime. There were now to be three national wireless networks. The Home Service as the flagship, providing middle-brow programming, the Light Program, offering continuous entertainment, and alongside these, a completely new network, the third program, aimed at the discriminating listener and covering the arts, science, experimental drama and music. The press, however, were more interested in the fledgling television service that had been put on hold when news of the war had been announced. And Haley's reply to that was that television, and I quote, would have to wait its turn in the national queue. Haley should have explained it in more detail because it was thrown back in his teeth over the years that followed with the allegation that he was not interested in television. That was not true. Radio had been there before the war. Radio had been there through the war. Radio had a great array of facilities and resources. It had transmitters, it had studios, it had equipment, it had all those things. It had outside broadcasting facilities, everything that was necessary to provide extensive services. Television, on the other hand, pre-war, had been on a very experimental basis, operating only in a limited way for an hour or two in the evening in the London area. And television, if it was to be developed at all, needed a vast amount of money spent on it. Now, the problem was that we were an impoverished nation. We were almost a bankrupt nation. After the war, hundreds of thousands of homes had to be rebuilt. Hundreds and hundreds of, of factories and industrial plants that had been destroyed or partly destroyed by bombing. So that for several years after the war, no matter how much money you could afford to spend in your company, whatever your company was, you could only spend it 
on capital uh, development if you had a license to do that. And these licenses were very strictly controlled indeed. And television was certainly looked upon as a luxury, not an essential service at that stage. The development of television was held up not by the BBC, not by Haley, not by the Board of Governors of the BBC, but simply because of the lack of consent to employ capital expenditure. This was not really properly comprehended. It seemed also that, faced with the prospect of vision and sound, television itself was hardly comprehended. I remember very clearly, in about 1947, going to see the director of home broadcasting in Broadcasting House. His name was Nichols, Mr. Basil Nichols, called Benji by everybody. There he was, a big man, behind his desk, um, desk absolutely clear of, of paper, not a sheet of paper on it anywhere. You always find him with a clean desk. I don't know how he managed to keep his job going, but there you are. And he was looking at television. There was his little television set, 12-inch screen, black and white, there it was, putting on quite a good picture, showing Wimbledon. And it got me talking to him about the development of television, and I asked him how he saw the future for the television service. This was the director of home broadcasting in the BBC, the man in charge of television, and the number two man in the BBC hierarchy. And he said, oh, well, it's quite simple. He said, uh, it, it's going to be like a book. He said, uh, in a book, you've got the, the printed word, that'll be radio, and then you've got the photographs and the illustrations, that'll be television. And he said, in years to come, you'll buy your radio times, and there will be the, a list of the programmes on offer. They'll all be radio programmes, he said, and against some of them in the radio times, there will be an asterisk, and that asterisk will indicate that there are television illustrations. That's how we shall use television, he said. And that is actually how many quite important people in the BBC and outside, and I emphasise, and outside also, thought that television would develop. It would simply be an added-on thing to radio. And it was only because the staff in the BBC's television service were so determined that they were going to become a service on their own. And their service was going to grow ultimately when all the restrictions were lifted. And they were going to overcome all those problems and they were going to become a, a more powerful force and a more powerful medium than radio had ever been. And also, of course, the way in which television developed overseas and particularly in the United States, it was these factors which forced the BBC in the end to see television as a completely new medium providing its own programmes quite distinct from those of radio. And in 1950 at last, a director of television was appointed and he was given a seat on the BBC's board of management. And of course, from that day onwards, television and BBC never looked back. But it was in the field of radio that Frank Gillard excelled. And because of the comparative remoteness of the West region from London, he was able to experiment down there in Bristol and get away from the more rigid and old-fashioned disciplines of the corporation. In the process, he created a winning formula that is still running today. Everything in radio up to that point, uh, practically everything, was scripted and examined and, as it were, censored. That was the process. If you, if you wanted to put on a discussion program in radio, you assembled your speakers well ahead of the day in which the broadcast was going to take place. You launched them into a discussion. You recorded what they said. You let them talk for much longer than they were going to do when they went on the air. You then produced a transcript of it all, and you, the producer, edited it down into the, the shape and the style, and you took the quotes that were safe and you left out the quotes that were unsafe. And then that was the script of the broadcast. Then you brought them back in again to do the actual broadcast. And they had to be actors and act themselves from the scripts and of course masses of people couldn't do that effectively so that broadcasting of discussion programs and political argument that was heavily scripted and very stilted because of the way in which it was handled i tried to break that mold with any questions in radio and did in fact and from then on radio began to develop the impromptu and the spontaneous style of broadcasting i mean i invented the title any questions i wish to god i'd put a copyright on it because you know it it was copied all over the country, women's institutes and gatherings of professional people and all the rest of it, they had an evening together and, uh, you know, they had their supper, their meal, whatever it was, and then they had an any question session. I mean, any questions was used thousands, and it still is, thousands and thousands of times to describe a style of exposition, uh, of discussion, which is spontaneous and more open. 
May I, as a point of fact, just Pardon. remind you that the calories that were granted to unemployed men in the five areas in 1931 to 33 were greater calories than many people have had on rations in this country, especially old people. Well, it's a, if, that, if, 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 the health, if the health of this people, if the British people is so much worse, it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it, that many fewer children die in uh, infantile mortality than died before. Many fewer mothers die at the time of childbirth than died before. It. And that every statistic shows that, in fact, the health of the British people is much better today than it was even in 1938. Please, please. No. Look at look at the children. Yeah, this is where I learned about it. No, we've thrashed this question until it's very nearly dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think from what I've been hearing that uh, none of us here need worry. It won't happen in our time. <laughs> they were terrified of any kind of innovation which would let down the standards. And if a thing was scripted, it could be polished and every word could be looked at and improved upon and so on. Lots and lots of people would advise on it. Whereas if it were spontaneous, you might get all sorts of crude statements going out over the air. You might, might get all sorts of rather vulgar things said. You, know, you, you might even have to apologise for some of the language used. You know, this is all going to be a let down for the BBC, which is rather proud and a dignified way, and a slightly pompous way, to tell you the truth, of the standards it had built up. You're listening to Frank Gillard's BBC, with me, David Attenborough, here on Radio 2. Although Frank Gillard's official position within the BBC was to supervise the West Region's programming, he was also frequently called upon to cover royal events, both happy and sad. In 1947, while accompanying the monarch on an important state visit to South Africa, Poor Frank had to fill in for an hour and ten minutes when a banquet in Cape Town overran and the timing of the King's speech didn't go quite to plan. Five years later, Frank was one of the three BBC correspondents chosen to travel with Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh on their 1952 Commonwealth tour, the one that ended so abruptly in Kenya with the sad news of the death of King George VI. Here is Frank on one of the happy days reporting from outside Buckingham Palace on November the 20th, 1947, the day of Princess Elizabeth's wedding. Well, here at the palace, we're waiting for that moment for the arrival uh, of the carriage procession of the bride, and I'm looking from my position here at the foot of the Queen Victoria Memorial, I'm looking through into the quadrangle, and there, right across on the far side of the palace, I can see a white figure, and I think it must be Her Royal Highness about to come and enter her coach with His Majesty the King for her drive to the Abbey. Meantime, the crowd out here, as you can expect, is absolutely on tiptoe with expectancy. Away over on the right, they've completely broken through the police cordon. They swarmed across the road, and it's quite hopeless for the police to attempt to get them back. And, and there are the orders, and there is Her Royal Highness about to enter the coach. And again, we shall hear, I think, the national anthem. In July 1955, Frank Gillard moved to London as chief assistant to the director of sound broadcasting, where he seized the opportunity to develop a passion that had become very dear to him. In the early 1950s, VHF, now more commonly called FM, had opened up the prospect of many additional radio channels. Frank's years spent serving the BBC's West Region had given him a sense of the importance of local broadcasting, the provision of news and information to the local community by the local community and not from London. And we reached the point only two or three years later by 1958 at which the top hierarchy of the BBC was prepared to say, all right, let's see if we can go ahead with local broadcasting on a VHF basis. Let's put in an application to the post office. And this was done in the late 50s. And the post office, not unreasonably, said to the BBC, we're interested in your proposal, but we cannot approve it. We anticipate that within a year or so, the government will set up one of these frequent commissions of inquiry into broadcasting, and this matter of local radio must be something which we can't anticipate, which that committee, when it is set up, must uh, consider and must recommend to us. Sure enough, a year or so later, the Pilkington Committee was established. In due course, the BBC was invited to make representations. 
we went to Pilkington, uh, Sir Hugh Green and uh, Lindsay Wellington, the director of radio, and I, and uh, the other two sat back and put me into bat. And I did my pitch to the Pilkington committee, but it fell with a dull thud. I mean, there was clearly not much interest. Now, I was alarmed at this, and I therefore got hold of the list of members of the Pilkington committee, and one of them lived in my region. This man was named John Shields, and he was headmaster of the grammar school at Winchester. I wrote to him, and I said, look, you're in my region, and you're on the Pilkington committee, and as far as I know, we've never met, except the day when I came to speak to the committee, and uh, you really ought to know something about regional broadcasting at any rate. Uh, why don't you come and pay me a visit? And he replied and said, I'd love to, I'm a schoolmaster, but I've got a half-term weekend coming up, and I'd like to come and spend that weekend with you in Bristol. Is that okay? So he came and he stayed with me over the weekend, and I preached regional broadcasting at him, and of course I really, really hit him as hard as I could over local. And I was asked to come back in the company of the chairman of the regional advisory councils, the English advisory councils, that's uh, Midland and North and West, three of them. And my chairman in the West was an admiral, Admiral Sir Mark Pisey, a very quarter-deck gentleman indeed, great friend of mine. And I pumped him as full of local radio as could conceivably be imagined in the weeks preceding this. And I also went around and saw the other two and got them wholly on my side. So that uh, when we went for the second visit to Pilkington, I not only held forth myself, but I had this great reinforcement of these three, including Pisey, the Admiral, who thumped the table at them and said it would be a crying scandal in the country if they didn't take this case seriously and recommend the introduction of uh, local radio. So this time they really began to sit up and take notice, but it was clear to me that we couldn't expect to convince them, or indeed anybody else about this, unless we could show something, unless we, we could produce some evidence, some demonstration of what local radio would be like. This is your local BBC station serving Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole. Well, that's how it'll all start tomorrow morning. But only the staff at the BBC studio at Poole will hear it. But this is an exercise. It's all being taken down on a tape recorder, but none of it will be going out on the air. The idea of it all is to show that it's possible to put on a week of local broadcasts. So far, the BBC have done it a day at a time at various places. It's expected that the Pilkington Committee, which is considering the future of broadcasting in this country, will be hearing some of the recordings later this month. Then I let the Pilkington Committee know that we had this stuff and perhaps they'd like to hear it. And Sir Harry Pilkington, as he then was, decided that they would and decided that they'd like to hear it in an informal setting, which was marvellous for me. The great thing about the informality was, you see, that I could now speak to the committee as I wished. If you appear before them in a formal way, you can only answer their questions. And if you deviate from the questions, Pilkington quickly said, that wasn't what we asked you, Mr Gillard, you see. And often, therefore, you didn't get the chance to punch home what you felt was really important. Hugh Green came with me and Lindsay Wellington, and we all agreed afterwards that it really, obviously, went down extremely well. We didn't know how well for another year uh, when the committee reported, and there in print was the finding, the government should agree to the introduction of a local radio system in, in Britain. The committee had been impressed by the evidence put before it. It should be run by the BBC. It should be paid for out of licence revenue. This was 1962, August. And there it was. I mean, that really was quite a triumph because they had started totally agnostic and we'd been able to win them over. But then the government said, oh, well, the BBC's got so much else on its plate. Look, we are, we're saying it should introduce a second television service. We're saying it should get into colour television and so on and so on. Let this local radio thing wait. We don't see any evidence in the country that people want local radio. Well, of course they didn't because people in the country can't kick up a fuss and create a great demand for something that they've never experienced and of which they have no idea, no concept. Well, in fact, local radio had to wait several years before finally going on air. Radio Leicester, the first BBC local station, finally hit the airwaves on the 8th of November, 1967. Frank Gillard had been appointed Director of Sound Broadcasting in 1963 and found that everything in the garden was far from rosy. To be quite fair, I found it in the doldrums. And certainly this was the kind of message that I got from Hugh Green and from the board, and that uh, it was time somebody went in there and did something to waken up radio and uh, 
generally speaking, to redecorate it and uh, refurbish it. That was easier said than done because financially we were in a desperate condition. There was no spare money there at all. And the only way of, uh, of making uh, advances in one direction was to cut back in others. Perhaps the biggest furor that Frank generated was from his decision in 1964 to axe this. Ah, oh, good morning, officer. Uh, do you think you could do anything with this lamb? He seems uh, almost too overcome to speak. Uh, uh, no, come, my poor lamb. What is it? Oh. Come, tell Uncle oh, Ernest. No. I mentioned I had uh, uh, partaken of sausages for breakfast, and he immediately began to carry on like this. Oh, Mr. Master, did you, did you eat all the sausages? Why, yes, certainly, my lamb. And very fine they were. Oh, oh Mr. Mayor, then you have eaten my friend Dennis so bad. <laughs> that was an extract from Children's Hour. But by then, nearly all children had simply stopped listening and by far the larger portion of the programme's audience were grown-ups. Frank was besieged with angry demands for its reinstatement. There was even a motion signed by 60 MPs. The repercussions of Frank's axing of Children's Hour persist to this day. When Radio 5 was first launched, it carried a substantial amount of children's broadcasting, but this subsequently disappeared when the station was relaunched as a 24-hour news and sports network. Frank was also observant enough to understand the growing importance of pop music to young people, the provision of which was stymied by restrictions placed on the corporation's use of commercial gramophone recordings. The situation which I inherited was that we had 27 hours of needle time allowed us for all purposes, per week. And of course, uh, needle time is under the copyright control of the record companies. They were prepared to concede a lot more, provided we paid for it, but the Musicians' Union would not. And the Musicians' Union flatly refused a single extra hour of additional needle time. Well, I felt this had to be brought to a head. So we pressed it on the Union and finally said to them that if they rejected our case, we would take it to the Performing Rights Tribunal, which is a statutory body which you can invoke when you encounter refusal by a licensing authority to license the use of its products to you if you think you have a legitimate case. Now, we couldn't proceed against the Musicians' Union at the tribunal. We could proceed against the record companies. But the record companies would say, we're perfectly willing to give these people the needle time. It is the Musicians' Union who won't. And we would get a ruling from that tribunal that the union couldn't ignore. Well, the union brushed this aside because they thought we were bluffing. And in the end, we got a date fixed for a tribunal hearing. The tribunal was mobilized. We got all our paperwork done. And the union began to realize that we meant business. About ten days before the tribunal was due to sit, the union began to say, well, can't we have one last shot at resolving this? And Arkell and I said, right, certainly. This was on a Friday afternoon. And we said, we'll start with you at 10.30 on Monday morning. And will we agree that we'll sit there day and night until we come through with something? I said, OK, that was how we did it. And we started in Arkell's office at 9.30 on the Monday morning. We took about six hours a night off, or seven hours, you know. We went on to the small hours and started again at nine o'clock in the morning. And on the Thursday evening, we finally reached a resolution with them, which raised our quota of needle tire from 27 hours a week to 75. But, unknown to Frank, even more troubled water lay ahead. <laughs> yet another of these ships getting ready to broadcast uh, from somewhere in the English Channel we don't know where. Now in the past these things had come and gone. Uh, uh, they'd had their brief day, they'd never been very successful, they'd been no more than flea bites, the BBC disregarded them. So we all gave a happy little laugh and we went off to our lunches. Little did we know because this was the beginning of the really big pirate attack on us. Broadcasting four miles off the Fringe and Essex coast, controlled from Amsterdam, Paris, New York, and Toronto. This is Radio Caroline International on 259, the time exactly 12 midnight.
Uh, we, of course, wanted to shut down these pirates. We put all the pressure we could on the government, but the government, uh, you know, wasn't going to be bothered by a little flea bite like this. Certainly wasn't inclined to take any particular action until it began to get protests from European countries. Italy protested to the British government because one of these pirate ships was using the wavelength properly assigned to Rome radio and was blotting out Rome radio after dark in many parts of its service area. Of course, the British government's reply was, we can do nothing about it because these ships are outside our jurisdiction. They're beyond the three-mile limit there in international waters. Well, that really was a pretty feeble excuse, everybody felt. And in any case, there was a real danger that these ships were interfering with the safety services of mercantile marines and um, operations and that sort of thing. SOS messages were getting blotted out, so it was said, and so on. I went to the board one day and said, what I would like to propose is that when the long wave and the VHF light program is doing talk of any kind, the medium wave 261 detaches itself and carries on with music, so that anybody wanting nothing but music, pop or light music, would listen to 261. Well, the board didn't like this at all. They threw it out on principle. This, you know, they took this beneath contempt attitude, this popular music stuff, you know, and we ought to be doing it and all the rest of it. Um, my reply to that, of course, was, but look, we've given our first priority to serious music. We've brought in an all-day serious music program. It's only fair that the much larger audience that wants light music should now have our attention. But at this stage, the board really wouldn't listen to me. They bounced me out. I never got such treatment from the board before or since, but they just bounced me out, and I was really rather hurt by it. And it was quite clear the board was wrong. Someone had to go back to them with Hugh Green's backing support. And I went back this time with a new strategy. And I said, look, uh, something's got to counter these pirates. They'll, they'll go off the air sooner or later by government action. Something's got to replace them. If we aren't doing it, the government will look to somebody else to do it. And I put to them a stronger proposal about 261 this time, that we should take it away permanently from the light program network. And we should establish it as a network on its own and make a fourth program out of it. And this time, rather reluctantly, they agreed. And so we sent this proposal to the Postmaster General, who was Ted Short, which led in the end to the introduction of Radio 1. That autumn, and I'm talking about 1966, I had gone up to Blackpool to be at the Conservative Party conference, where I was greatly embarrassed by an emergency resolution, which the conference discussed and passed overwhelmingly, that the next Tory government should bring in commercial radio, since the BBC was not doing a total job. And uh, hardly had that finished at Blackpool, then I got a, an urgent message from Hugh Green to return to London, and I came shooting back here, and he said to me, look, I just found out that this draft white paper which Ted Short has put to the cabinet and which in principle they've approved, though not in detail, contains, would you believe it, a recommendation that a completely new broadcasting authority should be formed for radio, that it should operate a pop music network and all local radio, and it should be paid for out of advertising, but on a non-profit basis. So what do you think of that? And of course I was very dismayed by it, and so was Hugh. I mean, he really was very upset by this. So what we did was this. We just leaked this little bit of private information to all our friends. We leaked it to political groups. We leaked it to educational groups. We leaked it to uh, municipal groups, to social groups, to all the people, in fact, who we thought would be alarmed about this, and even to the unions. And as a result of this, we got them all geared up to go one after another to the Postmaster General and to say, look, we hear that this is what the government is thinking of and it would be a great mistake. We're not going to support you on it. And there's a, a story I'm told is perfectly true that Ted Short had been to a meeting with a group of protesters. I don't know who they were. Educational people, I think. University people, I believe. Anyway, as he was walking back from this uh, protest um, group to his private office with his private secretary, he said to his private secretary, well, I think I've heard from just about everybody on this now, except the two archbishops. And when he got back to his desk, there was a letter from the two archbishops requesting that he meet them on this subject. 
So we really were very effective in our propaganda. Just for fun. Music. Too much. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. Yes, me. We've even got Arnold back. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of the Tony Blackburn shows. I shall be waking up every morning except Sunday between 7 and 8.30. So let's away! We got Radio 1 on the air in September of 1967, which was uh, eight or nine months after the authorisation, which was pretty good going, really. I did have a problem with some of the unions, particularly equity, which made a big fuss about uh, the, the fact that we were introducing a new network which wasn't going to give any employment to any of their members. If we had a new network, it should be a mixed program network and it should have lots of talk in it and drama and that sort of thing. And in fact, they called together this formidable body called the Safeguards Committee, representing 16 unions, even including the Football Players Association. And I had to go in front of them and say to them, well, the hell with you people. I mean, it's my job to decide and the corporation's job to decide what we're going to broadcast. We're not going to have any dictation of that kind from unions. From our own staff, yes. I mean, talk to them, uh, but not certainly not to you people who stand to gain or lose by what we do. This is our policy and we're going to go ahead with it. And in the end, they, they stood down. Well, Frank Gillard himself never has stood down. Having presented a paper on broadcasting in the 70s, which contained, among many things, a recommendation for a reduction in the number of BBC orchestras, he retired from the corporation at the end of 1969, whereupon he became a distinguished fellow of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in the United States, and also went on to assist the Australian Broadcasting Commission. He had been made a commander of the British Empire in 1961 for his services to broadcasting, and he's continued to contribute to many BBC programmes, including documentaries on Field Marshal Montgomery and Lord Reith. Currently, Frank is actively documenting the history of the BBC in both sound and vision, in the hope that this material will be used for the corporation's next big anniversary, that of its centenary in 2022. When I was a staff producer in the television service, I had known Frank's name as one of the great panjandrums, not to say legends, of the BBC. He had, after all, among many other things, supervised the establishment of the Natural History Unit in Bristol. So when I eventually joined the BBC's board of management and sat alongside him, I was astonished to discover that he spoke with such modesty and gentleness. He didn't bark, he didn't bang the table, he didn't brandish all the obvious weapons and badges of authority. He was just, quietly and politely, hugely authoritative. And we all listened, for we all knew that when he spoke, we were hearing the true voice of public service broadcasting. Frank Gillard's BBC will be around for a long time yet. On the air, if you have a little time to spare, you'll enjoy each minute, I'll declare. While we're on the air, you can see Just as happy as a king All the while you sing Though you are near or far That makes no difference to me Just begin to write in We're like a big family On the air Greetings everybody While we're on the air. You've been listening to Frank Gillard's BBC, presented by Sir David Attenborough. The programme was researched and written by Stephen Pattinson and produced by Anthony Wills.
Next Sunday at 10, you can hear Frank Muir and Dennis Norden's Funny Old Auntie. And the celebrations of the BBC's 75th anniversary continue here on Radio 2 this Tuesday at 9.30 when Joan Bakewell tells the story of John Logie Baird in Seeing by Wallace.